Hello, how are you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's it with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> devil are you this Thursday? Well, I bet you're a damn sight warmer than last Thursday. I know I am. I was snowed in, but it was nice. You know, it was, it was mother nature's way of saying, look, Craig, there's no trains. There's no cars. There's no meetings. You can't go anywhere. Go to the kitchen, make a stew. And then if you want, pop your boots on and go across the road to the pub. And that, your honor, is the only reason why I did it because mother nature told me to. But enough about what I did last Thursday. How are you? Everything good? Look, thank you so much for downloading and joining us, you know. It really means the world to us because this is episode 33 and we go to Sheffield to sit down and have a brew with artist, musician and honestly, all-round top bloke, Mr. Pete McKee. More of that in a sec. What else? A few things to tell you. I'm going to try and drive through it as quick as I can. I don't want to bore you. So we have packaged up a little thing for the British Podcast Awards. We thought, you know, we'd throw our hat in the ring for it. Why not? We know that there's so many brilliant and diverse podcasts out there that will be vying for a nomination, but we thought we'd try it. So I will keep you up to date with that. Also, I want to thank you for your emails and your messages about our first ever live episode with Ingrid Oliver last week. It went down so well. Now, speaking of live, I've got some dates for you. Dates. 19th of May. We are so honoured that we've been invited by the Charlatans as part of their takeover in Northwich. So... 19th of May, we have not one, but two live Two Shot Pod episodes. The first one, right, is going to be with legendary Hacienda resident, Mr. Dave Haslam. We will be talking all things. We'll be talking Tony Wilson, Morrissey, Tracy Thorne, John Peel, Marky Smith. He'll also be doing a little reading from his autobiography called Sonic Youth Slept on My Floor. I'll tell you how to get tickets for that in a sec, because I've got something else to tell you. Again, the same day, the 19th of May, our second event is with none other acting legend, Mr. Paddy Considine. We're going to sit down. We're going to have a real brilliant natter for about an hour. And then Paddy is going to introduce a screening of his new film, Journeyman. Now, you can get tickets for both of those events. The first one with Dave is going to be three quid, three quid less than a pint. The second one with Paddy, that's a two shot podcast live with Paddy and a screening of his new film, Journeyman, eight quid. All you need to do is go to Dice FM forward slash Journeyman Dave Haslam, download the Dice FM app, right? It's available on iOS and Android. Now, this protects fans and artists from touts. Once you pay for your ticket, it gets stored securely on your phone. You just flash that, you're in. It's going to be an amazing couple of events. Then, the 23rd of May, we jump in the motor and we go to the Bath Festival. Now, the 23rd of May, it's one episode but with two guests. I can't tell you who it is yet, but I will in the next few weeks. Go to bathfestivals.org.uk forward slash the Two Shot Podcast for tickets. You are not going to want to miss it. Trust me. I have witted on enough. This is episode 33 with artist, musician, Mr. Pete McKee. Enjoy. Here we are sat with a nice cup of tea from a a McKee mug, I do believe. Nothing nothing but the best will do. I'm here in Sheffield uh, with Pete McKee. 
How the devil are you? Afternoon. I'm, I'm fine, yeah, I'm good. I've been lounging around the house while you've been driving across Woodhead trying to get to our house. I know, we've got to keep warm this January. I wouldn't want to step out. If it wasn't for this, I'd be still at home with a fire on, to be honest, I can't mate. blame you. Have you always been in, you've always been in Sheffield, haven't you? You've always lived here. I've never left. I've left to go on holiday. I'm always coming <laughs> back. <laughs> after about, yeah, in fact, it gets to the point now that if I'm if I'm away from Sheffield for more than like five days, I get homesick and get all like agitated. I have to get back again. Yeah, huh? I'm terrible now. Do, yeah. do you feel it? Do you feel Sheffield's changed over the years? I mean, obviously it has. But mm. what, are there any what significant things about it's changed for you and for uh, for the better? Or <laughs> it's a good question. Um, there's not a great deal you can do to Sheffield really to to improve. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean that in like a, um, in its, I'm, I'm living in like the greatest city in the world, but, which I do believe that to be the case, but uh, it's a tiny city centre, so there's not a lot you can do to kind of do anything. In, well, you can, I suppose, there are ways you can improve Sheffield, and that is if Meadowall didn't exist and the town centre would be a lot busier, and therefore there'd be a lot more independent shops and stuff. So it tends to have just morphed into one of those standard towns where there's nothing new and exciting shopping wise, yeah. uh, but you know it's if you if well, you're that fortunate, enough, happens to so many places. Well, it does, doesn't it? it? Yeah, and so there's no I can do about that, no. and you know I can't be. But it's got its own little niche areas now for shopping that uh, picking up, which is really nice. Neeps and which is um, we're in an industrial area and now. It's really turning itself round. It's I'm not saying it. I've mentioned showed it showed its once already today, but you know it's it's kind of that like so regeneration kind yeah. of thing that goes off in, in cities like Manchester's Northern Quarter and all that kind of thing. So Sheffield's sort of picking up on that idea of uh, moving itself outward rather than inward uh, with little boroughs. So where my gallery is situated, that's quite a nice little run where there's lots of um, butchers and greengrocers and fishmongers and also independent little shops and that's a really nice run you could spend a, a good Saturday afternoon mooching and Neeps End again it's, it's that, that area where it's all kind of where the, the cafes, restaurants and real ale boozers and stuff like that so it's a great little place in fact in that area that's just sort of generated uh, it's it's become this like middle middle aged middle class like <laughs> Hunt, uh, hunting ground you, you can watch these like packs of these old old blokes and uh, and the wives and stuff wandering out streets to the next little real ale boozer or little kind of tapas bar <laughs> that's what saturday afternoons are made of surely exactly yeah but the one thing i i've always loved about sheffield is it's kind of that that city that, that has its knows its identity. Mm. You know, a bit like Manchester, it knows yeah, what it is. Yes. And there's, I feel there's always something creative going on. There's mm-hmm. always something bubbling or something happening yeah. or word of mouth thing that you can find. Yeah, it, it tries to be. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that Sheffield, for me, I feel it's a very creative city. It's got very creative individuals in mm. there. They either, they've either been born in Sheffield and, and sort of expanding their own kind of ideas or people have come to the city adopted it as their own and then decided to try something with this city but it's really it's its own little independent island because it doesn't seem to get much kind of credit for its existence or any recognition so like obviously manchester is a, a massive cultural city and it you automatically um, assume it is so it, it, it gets naturally uh, a lot of retention whereas sheffield kind of keeps jumping up and down and waving its arms around it now and <laughs> nobody's, <laughs> nobody's paying any attention to it so we've got nothing else to do but do it ourselves so we yeah. just we kind of just become self-deprecating instead but i think the people in the know know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in a way that's kind of nice you know the, it's yeah. the little exclusive yeah. club oh, of course that's <laughs> it yeah absolutely yeah and what was growing up like in sheffield Pete? well i grew up on a council estate you know, called batemore which was basically it's a prefab uh, it, it was designed in 1966 when I was born, moved in there, and it's all flat-topped houses. So it's almost like uh, some some crazy man's idea of a Mediterranean <laughs> holiday village. <laughs> so it's like it's like Butlins without the fun, really. So, <laughs> so I, I heard when I was growing up that it was only meant to last about 15 years because it was prefab. You know, it weren't. It was supposed to be temporary. Yeah. And they're still there now. You know, my brother still lives in our family home when where I was brought up in. When my Is dad he? passed away, he, he inherited the uh, the house, the council house from him. Yeah, so, so I've, and I lived on the estate for a while as well after I left. I came back and my little son and my wife, we all lived on there. He grew up on the Batemore estate. Was it just you and your brother at home? 
I had no, I had three, I had two brothers. Uh, so me, my two brothers, my sister moved out when I, I kind of came into the world. They weren't enough room that she'd got a book. She'd been caught in and they got married and moved out. So were you the youngest? I, yeah, very much so. Yeah. By, by, <laughs> there's a little legend. Um, my brother and sister are 15 and 16 years older than me. Um, my middle brother's seven years older than me. So my brother and my oldest brother and sister, they were just like, Obviously planned. <laughs> my other brother were a mistake, and I were a tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they had to deal with me. <laughs> yeah, my little sister's ten years younger than me. All uh, right, yeah. I'll, I'll not let her listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> She'll know she's a tragedy. Yeah. Um, and school life for you, what was that like? Yeah, uh, just typical. To typ- you know, I was. Uh, Did you enjoy it? No. No, not really. No, I were kind of, uh, I over, I compensated for my inability to, to learn properly or write. I used to be terrible at spelling. So reading and writing was just horrific for, for me. And so when everybody were on these little books that you like amber books and then you turned up in different colors and the yeah. more, the, the, you know, so you started off on maybe like, I don't know, let's say red and then you ended up at aqua. But I quite like you were at top level. So I, I was still uh, kicking around red when everyone else was advancing. And I just, you know, it just really like kind of uncomfortable uh, as a kid growing up. Was that not being able to grasp it? Was it anything to do? Was it anything um, sort of medical? Or was that just you? It just wasn't well, that meant I, for you? Well, it's never been diagnosed. I've, I've never sort of said I'm dyslexic or anything like that. And I cope quite well now. So I don't know where it was. But at that time, the only subjects that really kind of appealed to me were the art side of things, so drama and, and, and art. And did you have that at your school? Mm, yeah, yeah, well, obviously, back in the day, I mean, I grew up, I mean, I left school in 82, so comprehensive schools were still quite strong then, and yeah. the teaching process was really embracive of, of all kinds of things. So they were at Rollinson, where I grew up in the comprehensive, they had a drama studio mm. you know they had where you could put plays on and stuff like that so drama was a massive thing and uh the the when when i chose drama as one of my subjects unfortunately uh there were, when you know people applied to do drama so i had to do it in, in the lunch hour but the drama teacher was really cool about that and so there was about eight of us and we just all did it in our lunch hour which was fantastic and that were brilliant uh so there was drama art pottery there were metal work departments and woodwork and yeah. you know kilns in pottery departments and stuff like I, that because you were just at a normal state school well right? exactly yeah. and we took it all for granted yeah you know, and why not but now i believe that all oh, that's kind of changing yeah a lot and of it's, it's all so, gone. so difficult now for kids to have a creative identity because there's, there's there's 10 years difference between me and you ah, and, right. and my state school in blackpool sounded exactly the same mm-hmm. we had the drama department we had the art department art i couldn't do oh my god it was that to me was like you're reading and writing i mean it was yeah. just an absolute nightmare yeah. for me because i get frustrated but i would i would have yeah. loved to have done stuff like that yeah but it's just a shame nowadays that that's being taken away mm. and stifling the youngsters creativity it's yeah it's, I, I was talking to uh, i was in manchester with a, a poet this morning and um he sometimes goes into schools yeah and they say to the students uh and you know, these young ones you know they're not like college students at school We've got a poet coming in, oh, bloody poet coming in. <laughs> and he comes in and his inspiration is from a lot of rappers and things like that. So oh, they right. don't, and he's sort of spitting out all oh. these rhymes about the Northern Quarter and the state of England today. And they're going, oh, my God, what's going on? <laughs> and they're, they're getting inspired by him. Of course, him. yeah. It's an absolutely brilliant thing. So I'm going to try and, I said, you should be going around to every school. Yeah, <laughs> Full yeah, stop. yeah, yeah. And... What did you have any aspirations at school? Did you? I mean, obviously the creative side here was being fulfilled. But do you think? Did you think at that point, being so young, oh, this is what I wanted to do for a living? No, it was it was definitely that sort of thing. I wanted to use art as 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 a career move for sure. I wanted to go into art. Well, funnily enough, I actually wanted to become an actor. <laughs> I wanted to go to drama school. Did you? Yeah, but I thought that you're not supposed to do that when you're working class. I thought it was a daft thing to do. <laughs> So, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't pursue it because I didn't, I didn't think it meant I were meant to be able to to act. What a shame! Man. Yeah, so I, I, I stuck with the art side of things, which is absolutely fine. Are oh, you doing all right? Mm, yeah, I'm all right. Yeah, <laughs> we're actually, but prior to that, the the, the thing that I thought was going to really make me uh, rich and famous was uh, being a musician in a band. So for, for like six years of my my life, 
And that was basically how I was going to make my living. So I didn't care that I left school without any real proper education or qualifications. I mean, I I did all my exams, but they weren't particularly, I weren't setting the world alight with my results. Me too. (laughs) And so, so yeah, so I thought, well, it doesn't matter because I'm going to be on top of Pops in a couple of weeks' time anyway with this band. Just like that. So so I left left sixth form halfway through uh, the first year. I weren't weren't turning up for any of the lessons and this teacher came in to the common room where we all played um, three-card brag. And he came up to me and says, what are you doing here? And not in what you're doing playing three-card brags, but yeah. what, what you're doing in sixth form, you're just wasting your time and our time. And he went, I went, you know, you're right. And I, just, I left that day. Did you? Went to my brother who were working in this factory. I said, if there's any jobs going, will you let me know? And I'll go for an interview. He said, okay, then. And then sure enough, a week or two later, I were, I were down having an interview for this job in this factory. And what again, were you, it was- we doing in the factory? It were a kitchen factory, and I, I would just it were really menial kind of stuff. There they, they were these pre-molded uh, doors; they weren't they weren't wood. They were like this kind of foam stuff that sets rock hard, so right. it weighs like wood and looks like wood because it's in a mold. But they have these air bubbles, and you had to kind of pierce the air bubbles with this metal filed metal tool and fill it with wood filler and sand it down. And that was as that was as crap as it was as a job. <laughs> but I didn't care because they were in a band and they were going to be all right. They were going to uh, succeed in this band, but five or six years down the line and, and we were still playing to 20 people. I realised that that weren't, uh, weren't for me. I had to go to plan B, which was the art again. So I went and I simply went and re-educated myself, did my English O level and then... Was this a, a poly or a college? Uh, night school. Night school? Night school. How old were you now at this uh, point? Oh, cracky, 25-ish or something right, like that, okay. 24, 25. And then from there, I then I also did my art A level Went and did an art foundation course, applied to go to art college, failed. <laughs> and so then I thought, well, I'll have to do it all by myself then. And for, for crikey, 15 years, I just basically made work part-time drawing cartoons and getting them published in greeting cards and uh, a couple of newspapers and stuff and working part-time. So I worked part-time firstly uh, as a postman, did that for quite a few years and then because it was to, subsidising the art. Yeah, that's it. I just thought, well, if I do a part-time job and then that'll leave me time to carry on doing my art and then between them two, I'll have made a money, you know, enough money to keep, you know, keep going. So I did those, did part work part-time. Then I went to Tesco's. I worked there for five years. And went, and on the fifth year of working at Tesco's, I realised it was just, you know, just again, it, nothing was kind of giving me a break. So the, the cartoon inside of it wasn't making any money at all or hardly any just enough to be supplemented with this. And my, my wife, who uh, suffers from um, bipolar, she, she wasn't able to work, so I was basically uh, um, financing the whole family just on these two part-time incomes. And so there, there had to be some kind of seismic change to how, how I did things. Yeah. And I thought, well, as a cartoonist, a freelance cartoonist, you, you make money, but you don't make enough money. You, you just you get by, but... Uh, fine art, it, it, you can maybe earn a little bit more money for for your artwork. Right, it's a bit more respected as a as a as a, a kind of profession. And now I, I I believe that the the talent that's required to become a cartoonist is exactly the same as it is to become a fine artist. It's just the perception that we have in this country uh, changes the value of that artwork. So I had to find a way to paint that complemented how I, I draw. So I'm not like someone who can go out into the field and, and paint a landscape in watercolours or in fine art oils. I had to be something quite simplified and, and very straightforward, communicative-wise communication. So it had to be cartoon-esque in some respects. But I knew that fine art, don't you, you can't do caricatures of people with fine art because it just comes straight down to being a cartoon again. Yeah. And then before no one takes any notice of it, it's not serious enough. So I had to find a way that I could draw people without drawing caricatures of the faces. or And so that's why my artwork is quite simplified in that respect, feature-wise with the face, because yeah. it's it's somebody but nobody in the same respects. So it worked really well for me, in fact, because it meant that you could adopt your own view of that picture to somebody you might know yourself even. So if I did a little kid just with scraggy hair, in ill-fitting trousers, then that's you growing up kind of thing. Or if I did an old couple, that's your nan and granddad because the features were taken away 
it, it, it wasn't anybody very specifically, it was him specific. So, so it really worked in that way. So when I came up with this idea, when I, cause obviously as a cartoonist, you're always drawing, you're always doodling, you're always changing your style and everything. So this particular one drawing I did kind of sort of went, wow, this guy's got just one line, there's like an eyebrow line and his nose. And he's just there and, and he's kind of looking blankly at me, but he's looking at me in some way and I can't quite work out why, but I'm connecting with this really simple drawing. I thought, well, that's it. I can use that face but adapt it to stories that I can tell. You know, I might have got something this. And, and and that in itself was an interesting thing because once I got the style, I had to work out what was going to be the subject matter for the pictures. And I was always, I was growing up really influenced by like kind of American comic strips and stuff like that. So I thought, so when I was drawing comic strips, I was drawing them in American sort of style, very sim uh, in in that sort of vein. But I thought, well, I can't do Americana, not in this country, and get, and get away with it. And then I watched this documentary about um, Ray Charles. Just one night, after, while I, you know, while I were uh, toying with this idea of what I'm going to do next in my life, and Ray Charles, in this documentary, sort of said that when he set out as a kid, he'd be going around all these joints, and he were um, doing Nat King Cole impersonations, he were doing Nat King Cole songs, doing it in a Nat King Cole style. Then this agent came up to him, this guy who owned this bar, and said, look, Ray, he says, you're great as Nat King Cole, but there's one guy better than you at Nat King Cole, and that's Nat King Cole. <laughs> What's Ray Charles doing? And he realised he had to be himself. And, yeah. and I interpreted that as I had to tell him, I had to be myself in my artwork. I had to tell the stories that I knew and understood. And uh, so from there on in, I just basically became very biographical in my work, but without mentioning names or anything like that. So... One of my, my my first ever exhibition was in the pub. I had nothing to lose, but I'll get back to that in a second. So my, my, one of my early paintings were these two kids looking inside. From you, you, the picture, the perspective of the picture is you're in, it's an in pub interior. Yeah. But the window in the pub, these two kids looking in. Right. And that was me looking in, trying to find my dad because I've been called up to go up to the pub by my mum to find my dad. Fetch him the, home. The, the, yeah, fetch him home. Yeah. yeah, so that, that's what it was called. And it was called Six Week Holidays because obviously in Six Week Holidays, your dad's still working on his shift. Yeah. And he's got to he'll nip up for a pint in the afternoon and you're, you get sent up to find him. And you're not allowed in pubs, so you have to knock out window. <laughs> but there's all these blokes and they're not even looking anywhere near the window because they don't want to call him back. They've still got a pint in their hand. So you're like this, knocking on the window. <laughs> um, <clears throat> where where did it come from? Sorry. The art did it, did it stem from your parents or your brother? Who who else mm. is Andy? No, my, my dad I think was was um, quite artistic, but it, it was never um, realised because he, he he basically worked um, from from leaving school at fourteen, I guess, or 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 whatever back in the day. Yeah, uh, works in the steelworks mm. and 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 so forth. But he were always doodling on on the side of the Daily Mirror and stuff like was that, drawing little characters and stuff. And he was also quite musical. My dad he used to play the pub piano, and he also way way back in the, in the like nineteen forties, he was in an art, an accordion band, like called the Accordion Serenaders, and they were all these like big, their um satin shirts and right. yeah it's uh, really funny so so it, it always been musical and so they, i think he was the creative side of the family but yeah there seems to yeah. be don't there yeah so so that's where so that's where that sort of came from i think and do you remember the time when you sold your first piece um well the first few pieces uh, that I, I i sort of did these sort of ones i did a couple for birthday presents and then I, a mate came round, uh, we had a party and uh, I got a few of them on the wall and a mate came round and bought them, bought a couple of them straight off the wall. And I thought, well, that's a mate, it, 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 this is going to do that. Yeah. You know, you can see I'm scra scraping two bob together and stuff like that. He, I'm skin. he's going to just be it, it's almost like a, a donation as much as anything else. So I didn't really take much heed in, in, in that. I was, I was obviously very grateful for his uh, generosity. But it did actually spur me on to think that there might be something in this. Give it a go. They've got no to lose. Yeah. And at that time, I really hadn't because we, we were absolutely skinned. So I, I did a, a set of pictures, uh, got an exhibition together at the Washington Pub in Sheffield, 
And it was just uh, in, uh, just at the beginning of December. Was it like ab- above the pub or in the actual No, it was pub? actually in the pub. I, I just figured that, well, the more people go to pubs than they go to art galleries. So more people are going to get to see the work. So... I just gave it a punt reel. I got no, like I said, I got no else to lose. So I did all these paints. I couldn't even afford to frame them. So they were done on uh, off cuts or hardboard sort of thing. And they were do, they were use, I used Dulux paint as well, house paint, because I got no, I couldn't afford to go and get um, get proper paints from an art shop. Right. But I just, I knew that, say, Lowry, for instance, he he, he would have created artwork on the backs of a back of a fag packet if he could just to create, you know. Yeah. It's like, you know, he painted on bits of cardboard, not just canvas. It, it, it was, a, I understood that art's not necessarily what the medium that you use, it's what you're expressing. It's how you express yourself. So whether you express that on uh, a canvas for 40 quid from an art shop using 100 quid worth of paints, or you express it on the uh, back of a shoebox uh, using emulsion paints, as long as... As long as what you're saying is someone can connect to it and have an emotion with that, then that's absolutely fine. End of. No, no need to go any deeper into it than that. So from there on in, so the first ever painting I did, it was a. It should have been used as a um, a shelf for, in the house. This bit of MDF, and I just got a few tins of paint because my wife, as you can tell in our house, she's got a, a good colour sense. So yeah. we, we don't just have magnolia in our house when it comes to. Uh, <laughs> Jewel looks paint. So I, I, I'd got these different coloured emulsion paints that we'd use around the house and I, I sort of cobbled together a picture in the style that I'd already decided this was going to be the the way I'm going to go with this. And so that's where I got this idea, right, don't worry about it being expensive in or the best quality equipment as long as you what you can get across is right. So I did all that, got enough uh, of these pieces together to cause a, uh, create an exhibition Sat there, launched it, and uh, yeah, I sold. I priced them up at a, what I thought what you, you, you price at original art art. <laughs> they didn't sell. Sunk that price down a little bit and started to sell them. So, absolutely happy days. I thought, Jesus, and it saved Christmas for us as well. Oh, so, I brilliant. sold like I sold three or four paintings, and that got me uh, enough money to get kids a presents and stuff like that, which were absolutely fantastic. Then quickly after that, I got another exhibition. People got the work really quickly and understood the stories behind it, really got into it. And it just sort of snowballed from that that moment on, from that very first exhibition. Whenever I did another one, wherever it was, I sold a few more paintings than I did the last time sort of thing, which were fabulous. And so, you know, it was even like a little restaurant. I had these little 12-inch square ones and I charged 90 quid for them. And I'd have to go in every week and, and put some new ones up because they were selling them while people were eating, you know That's what I mean? Brilliant. Yeah, so it was great. So so a year and a half down the line of doing that and still working at Tesco's. Um, oh, right, so you were still at Tesco's I was still time. at Tesco's. I didn't, I didn't quit Tesco's then, but I'd got like seven grand uh, amassed from doing these paintings. And Jane said, well, you know what? You've got this seven grand. You've got another exhibition coming up. Pipe working because that's what Tesco's were making me with seven grand. Packed Tesco's and see if we can live on this and see where we go with it and did that and that were, I never looked back from that moment on. Sometimes you've just got to throw it mm. all away and dive in. Yeah, absolutely, that were it. And I mean, it came at a point because um, Jane's father died and so she was in absolute bits and I knew that I had to take some time off from work to look after her because, you know, it was a very traumatic time for her and just, I just used that as a really good reason to... To, to quit Tesco's, look after Jane, and then push on with the art and take it as forward, as far forward as I possibly could. And did you always have that need, the the need to express? There was a something in there that you had to get it out? Yeah, yeah. There was no, there was no doubt in, throughout my life, no matter what it was that I took on, that I was going to be successful at it. Whether I was or I wasn't was irrelevant. The, the, the initial concept and the, the thought process always meant I had a belief that I was going to do well with this or or move on from it and so so let's say with the band I was very passionate with the band I just knew that that was going to be it the cartoon and I simply assumed I was going to be brilliant at that and so I've always been driven to to achieve something through my creativity and it only it, I'm just fortunate that <laughs> I've managed to find yeah. find a way of doing it because it took a while I can tell you because I you know from leaving school to now I'm 51 and um, 
I've only just living in my uh, the first house I've actually ever I've been living in rented council accommodation up until the last eight years. You see, loads of people just think. Yeah, well, it just happens. It's like when I talk to <laughs> actors and they go, oh, well, they, they do all right. And you yeah. go, well, wait a minute. They were out of work for eight years oh, or they right. grafted their yeah. arse off for 10 years. Nobody could give a shit about them. And all of a sudden it just mm. happens, but you have to mm. put in the graft. You do, you? yeah. And also so work hard. out, as you were saying, work out what your thing is and how to express it, whether mm. it is in art or whether it is in acting or poetry or... Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it, to... It, I I was always trying to work out recently what makes somebody get to that level or to push themselves in a, in a creative manner. Whether I don't know how to explain this. What well, whether it's just already in them or yeah. from the start? Or? Uh, that, no, the need. Whether you create the, the want. Yeah, it's interesting. I was talking to. Um, an actor called Tony Pitts, who's from Yorkshire, and mm-hmm. we discussed of uh, the need to want that he he has to do it. He mm-hmm. feels that he has to do it, and some people yeah. have that, and yeah. I think that's just that's just in him. Yeah, I think that's. I think it's absolutely an essential component in some respects. If if you're to try and survive, because it's okay to have a go and then fail. And then decide to move on to something else. Like but do, sometimes that's the best way of learning as well. Isn't well, it? it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, but there's that. It, but there's that obsession to to keep doing it, and and it's it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because you can see sort of that that X factor desire where you know that they you know really shouldn't be doing that. It's not for you at all. But they still determine that they are going to become the next big thing. And yeah. It's quite clear they're not going to be. So there's it's a difficult road to to tread that one. That obsession with believing that in yourself in a way isn't it yeah but sometimes you know that they in with regards to say tony for instance as, mm. a, as an example i remember him saying he has to do it he has mm. to create he has to do something whether it's writing a radio play or it's acting or it's do, he's yeah. got to do something if because he didn't get it out of him yeah then things happen <laughs> and it's not good. I, uh, do, do, right. you, do you? I mean, not in a, not in a, 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 any sort of way, but he would he would feel frustrated that he couldn't get it out. And I know a mm. lot of uh, creatives that are like that. Do you? I suppose it's see it's thing. You have such control over your work because it's mm. you. Yeah, uh, and I, I remember talking to a, a, a songwriter, and my wife was my wife my wife was very jealous because because you're not an actor. She said, it's great for you. <laughs> you can just get up, have your breakfast in the morning, have a cup of coffee and go, right, I'm just going to write a song. <laughs> because yeah. I can. Yeah, yeah. I can do that. Yeah. And I suppose that's the same with you. You can have your coffee and Yeah, go well, and no, I'm not going to deny that. I'm, I'm the most luckiest person on earth. Yeah. Because, no, because, I think it's brilliant. Uh, you know, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I've made it, I've managed to make a, a <clears> living <throat> out of doing something that I, I truly and utterly love. And I've, I've also managed to do it on my own terms as well, where in the past, Getting to this point, I wasn't. I, I kind of prostituted myself out quite a bit, and made bad decisions along the way to try and achieve money to make a living for myself and my family. Because at the end of the day, the biggest motivation of all of this is to make sure that I can we can survive. Exactly. In a sense, you know, it's yeah. putting you know, baby needs new shoes is the most is one of my favourite sayings because it it justifies the choices that you make in some respects to make money, to, to, to make a living. No one, no one should be criticised for doing something commercial because, you know... Well, everybody's got bills to pay. Everyone's got bills to pay, exactly. So, but there, there are some times when decisions uh, that you make aren't wise and um, you have to learn from those and that's what I've done. So I've, yeah. do, I've made those bad choices, I've done those bad things and some of those have cost me an absolute fortune. But from that moment on... I've not looked back and I know exactly that what I do is purely driven by myself and I make the choices. I work with people that I want to work with. Yeah. Not simply because it's going to be good. It's a good earner. So I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm in that position now where I necessarily wouldn't have been, say, 10, 20 years ago. It's, I suppose it's what we're all striving for is to have that complete control. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. And, uh, of course, and, and that, that, that that's in every, every profession, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 And do you have a set... 
working day? Like, do you go, right, I'm from, I'm going to 10 till 1, I'm, no? No, 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 it's, it, it, it comes and goes, it comes and goes. I mean, what I'm doing at this moment in time, I'm working on a new exhibition. And so that's how I can focus where I work, because then I've got a, a, a reason. I've got a, a, a starting point, what that exhibition's about, how I feel that exhibition, and how people get to find out about that exhibition. There are three things that I'm now concentrating on. So I'm in the middle bit now, which is basically filling the exhibition. So I, I constantly walk around the house or in bed, lay awake deliberately to get the brain working, to come up with ideas and, and, and think, uh, uh, start to thought process. And once I've got that sort of vision in my head, I kind of see the picture how it is in my in my mind. I know yeah. exactly what it's going to look like. So I don't really, really need to do preliminary sketches or anything like that then I'll just go to the studio in the garden, fortunately, and and get on and do it. So the, the, the first body of work is coming up with the ideas, and then I'll sit down and I will then block out a month or so to work continually painting to create them all once I've come up with all the ideas. So I just let it, it's, it's kind of like free, free form. Mm. Just letting every idea that comes in there get wrote down, working out how that can then be translated. And I've started to move, especially with the exhibitions that I do now, it's not always pictures on walls. It can also be like little installations, 3D things, bit of film and stuff like that. I'm, I like to try and just mix it up and have a laugh with it, really, yeah. as much as anything else. Do you sometimes throw everything at the wall and then look at mm -hmm. it and go, actually, right, no, that's not working, yeah. that's not working? Yeah, yeah, well, definitely, yeah. You just, it's funny because sometimes you're in the shower and an idea comes into your head and that's okay and that's brilliant. You go downstairs, you go into, and you, you create it. You, you do that idea that comes to you, that flash of brilliant inspiration. And that becomes just a standalone picture, got nothing to do with anything really, but it's just a great idea you yeah. had. And then when it comes to exhibitions, it has to become a little bit more formally, a little bit more rigid, structured, because you have to then find that narrative. Because I don't tend to do exhibitions which are basically... Um, a collection of just works that I've done over the last few years that I can cobble to get, not cobble, um, vaguely connect together as a narrative in some respect. These are all landscapes, for instance, just right. generally landscape pictures. Mine tend to have a narrative about something. So um, my last exhibition, which was Six Years to Eternity, was all about the six-week holidays that we used to have as kids. Quite a very nostalgic thing, which a lot of my work is. And so it was just all basically based around um, what we did in the six-week holidays. So I, I had to then suddenly write down a, damn, a big list of things that happened in the six-week holidays and then find a, a humorous or poignant narrative to fit that, in a yeah. sense. So there was one where there's a couple of kids and they're fed up on the, on the step of the back garden with all the toys around the feet. And that one was called Shush, Your Dad's on Night. So, <laughs> so which was one of the, the, you know, scenarios that I had as a kid. You know, you couldn't make a noise when you, when my dad were, uh, were you know, working the night, what exactly. night shift in the afternoon, you are having a kip. So half at six week holidays, you were silent around at your mate's house whose dad weren't on nights. Yeah. <laughs> That's such a brilliant idea for an exhibition. Because mm. those holidays, you know, when we were, it just used to last forever, didn't it? Once, Did six it? Yeah, weeks. Yeah. It was... Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. And is it always a theme you start off with? Mm. Yeah. And then yeah. we work from there. Yeah, it is, yeah. And, and <laughs> quite often they've got bigger and bigger my shows because uh, more and more people kind of like to go and come and see them. Uh, but because it got bigger and bigger as a, a, a show, I had to put them in bigger and bigger spaces, which means I have to do bigger and bigger things. <laughs> I've built a rod for me on back. So but that, what that means is the bigger the place is, the less I can afford to run it. So I can only <laughs> have these shows on for a day. Yeah. So I, the last show, the six weeks to eternity, I had it at the Magna Centre, which is like this big, it used to be a smelting factory. Right. Rolling mill. So it's this huge room and I had to fill that. Uh, but I could only afford to have it running for a weekend. So everybody had to come for that one weekend. But fortunately, this new show that I'm working on, I've, I've booked that out uh, for three weeks in this, like, disuse factory. In town? Uh, it's just, in, it's in Neeps and that, that... Right. That, oh, okay, right. Yeah, the Sheffield show that... Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's going to be running for three weeks um, when that comes out. And do you ever uh, get a block? Does anything like that happen to you? I always have, always have blocks, always. Uh, but I don't worry about those. I just I, I use those just to cogitate on other things. 
Because then you, you know, sometimes if you have that block and you do worry, mm. then the worry becomes. Yeah, that yeah, I, yeah. I, I never. I, I go through creative spurts, and I understand that now. So I can be very creative for a period of time, and then obviously, the blocks stop when you are challenged to do more work, in a sense. So if uh, I, I get a, an email, can you do this? And it's about that. Then yeah. Right, no problem. When do you want it for here? Right, yeah, I can do that. So therefore, I haven't got a block anymore because right. I've already got something to do. Yeah. And I can then use my brain to sort of find a, a path from A to, to Z, how to, how to work out what that story is I'm going to tell for this, this particular commission or, or uh, project. So as long as I've got those, then there's no, no, such, no such thing as a block for me. But on those moments where I haven't got those kind of bits and bobs to do work on, then quite often, yeah, it's just like a, a blank space in me in me noggin, uh, and, and that's why I need exhibitions. Yeah, because it gives me a reason to create. And then, and do you feel a need when you have the exhibitions to challenge yourself to mm. to go out? I need to one up myself here. I need to go. Yeah, I do. I do something different. I need to do something not necessarily bigger. But... Yeah, sometimes yeah, and I like to somehow throw little curveballs in. in uh, with with the paintings as well because I've got the luxury to be able to do that I can I can push myself or challenge myself to do a subject matter that necessarily would actually be um, in my kind of remit or not in the style because I very rarely change how I do my style but you know I, I like to play with things yeah a little bit yeah do you mind talking about the last couple of years for you yeah of course yeah because yeah. you know. I don't know if anybody knows I know, but you, you know, you were a, a tad poorly. <laughs> I was, yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, yeah. I'd, uh, I, I got diagnosed a couple of years ago with uh, cirrhosis of the liver. And at the time, it, it, it blew my mind. Uh, I couldn't understand why I'd got cirrhosis. And then it turned out that I'd actually got a genetic condition uh, called alpha-1 antitrypsin disorder. Uh, deficiency, sorry, not disorder, deficiency. And so we all produced this thing called alpha-1 antitrypsin and it's a uh, an enzyme or a, that's created in the liver and then gets passed into the bloodstream and then helps fight infections in the lungs uh, how did they how did they find it uh, blood test blood test yeah, just, yeah. just a run of the mill yeah. blood test well it, it, it was running the mill to the extent that i went into the doctor saying that uh, i've got a, a load of symptoms that on their own are nothing but together they all just ruining me days and that were like kind of feeling queasy all the time feeling cold feeling weak in my arms. Um, there were a few other things as well that I can't remember this off the top of my head, but they were all, all these things and then they were all individually, uh, collectively ticking this one uh, uh, prognosis, which was cirrhosis yeah. or liver disease. Well, the doctors understood that, but obviously I didn't. And they said, right, we need to send you in for a liver function test. And that's where they found the, the, in the bloods the, the alpha-1. Because uh, cause I, I didn't have enough of it. It was clogging up my the, the alpha-1 and trips in my uh, enzymes clogged together and weren't passing through the liver. And so uh, over time, it sort of damaged it to the point where I got this, I got cirrhosis of a, a, a 90-year-old alcoholic practically. Right. I, well, I didn't appreciate how bad my liver was at the time. Uh, you know, I was obviously I had to stop drinking and all that and look after myself. Uh, and I had a friend who I used to go, went to school with, uh, were in the same class together at Rawlinson called Sean Blubberth, who was a photographer. So I, I carried on I carried on the relationship with him through our, our creative uh, um, endeavours. And he also had cirrhosis too. And um, so I got a great deal of support and advice off of him, what to expect and and what to do. Uh, but, and, but he was an incredible person. He was so positive with how to deal with with the condition. You know, just he carried on working all the way through. He wasn't ever letting down. He had a smile on his face no matter when you saw him. And it was incredible. And he inspired me to be in the, in the same kind of positive vein. Were, then, the, were the doctors as positive? Were, were, well, yeah, they, well, they're, they're, they're always positive. I mean, the, the, the outcome was, as far as I was concerned, Sean... My friend Sean, he'd had his cirrhosis for about 10 years. Right. And it, it, it's really funny. It's a disease that you don't know you've got until you until it's probably too late. 
quite often because the symptoms really don't show themselves up until there's something tragic happens, like you start uh, um, coughing up blood or you know bleeding, uh, and that tends to be the varices in your esophagus that because there tends to be a build up of pressure. And your spleen it enlarges, and these varices enlarge because the blood can't go through your liver properly. Right. And when they when they when you when your varices start bleeding, then you don't know that they're bleeding, and it's really can be quite dangerous. You can actually lose your life from it. And uh, quite a lot of people find out sometimes too late, and it, it's very difficult for them to get a, a transplant in time. Because one of the problems with the transplant sort of thing is uh, you can't have a transplant until you're really ill, because there's not enough transplant organs around, whether it's liver, heart, lungs, kidneys. There's not enough donors to satisfy the need. So you're always, like, kind of on uh, the edge of wellness before you get a, a transplant. Yeah. And unfortunately, Sean got to the point where he went past being well enough to receive his transplant, and unfortunately he died before he got to have his transplant. In fact, he was in hospital waiting to get a transplant when he when he passed away, unfortunately. So I, 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 I was fully aware of the consequences of my situation if I didn't get a transplant too because of this. Um, and so, and I expected to not need a transplant for ages. I thought it would be the last thing that I needed. And it, it wasn't, like I said, it was almost just over two years before I, I was a... Uh, called in to, to, to get my transplant. I was really lucky as well. One of the one of the fortunate things about me and my condition is is that I'd actually got a relatively uncommon blood where it, uh, right. where everything else I'd got, I would, they were rare for the wrong reasons. <laughs> like the alpha-1 and trisomy was rare. And and uh, I've got a, I've got a bicuspal heart, uh, which is rare as well. And that nearly stopped me getting the transplant. Well, it would have been if my heart weren't strong enough. Yeah. But fortunately, it was to have the, the operation. So I had these couple of rare things, uh, but this was a one, one rarity that actually worked in my favour. And I managed to get uh, not be on the transplant list too long before I got my my transplant. And, uh, yeah. And it was all successful? It was successful, and it, it, it's incredible, absolutely incredible, how you feel afterwards as well. In what way? Well, I, I was... With, 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 um, with the liver disease, there are certain side effects that come with the condition. And one of those is um, a, a brain disease uh, called encephalopathy. And it's, uh, it's all the toxins that are in your waste that you, you would uh, normally expel out. They end up getting into your bloodstream right. and they then go into your brain. And then they, they mess with your brain and uh, slow your brain function down, your thinking, your cognitiveness, your, your slurring, your speech goes. Uh, you, you just you start losing it, you know, your, your memory and everything. And so that's one of the first things that you kind of really notice that is, is things are going bad. There's a, there's a test you can have, not have. When, you, when you've been to see your specialist and you realise you've got this encephalopathy, they give you a little test at home to do to just to sort of suss where you are with it, Yeah, how, how bad it is. And it's like drawing the Star of David with a pen without taking your pen off. Right. And if you can, and how, how many attempts it takes to do one of those without having to take you, to do it properly. Yeah. And there were, there were times it took me 16 attempts to get it right and stuff like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. so... So it really kind of really does messes with you. But it was one of the first things that I noticed had gone after the operation. It was amazing. Um, uh, immediate? Pretty much. Pretty within much. a day, yeah. Within God. a day, I'd, it, that had sort of disappeared and I just knew everything was going to be all right from there on in. Well, it felt like everything was going to be all right. And I just had such a positive attitude in hospital to, to get out and get on with it. I yeah. was just so grateful for the second chance. And ju just how, how, how brilliant it was not to feel so ill. It was amazing. And what a relief. Oh, I You're really right. apologise. Do me... not worry. Let me just turn that on. What a relief, though, for you and for your family as well. Yeah, it, it was absolutely a, a massive rele uh, relief, yeah. It, 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 it's, it, it's been utterly stunning, you know, the, the, this recovery... And um, just, I, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's, 
it's hard, it's really hard to explain. It's hard to explain. I'm, I'm, I'm losing, getting tongue tied now with this one. But yeah, it, it, it's it's amazing to, to to now be able to face to face the rest of my life. Uh, hopefully, knowing that I'm going to be going to be well well enough to carry on. Yeah, well. because. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I take a daily regime or anti-rejection tablets like everyone who goes to a transplant, but um, I, I feel absolutely fantastic at the moment, so all's well. Pete, one of the thrilled you are. <laughs> um, keep on fighting, fit, mate. Oh, and thanks so much for coming on. <laughs> Cheers, Craig. Thank you so much. I'm honoured. <laughs> the quite brilliant Mr. Pete McKee there. Pete, if you're listening, I want to say thank you so much. You know, Pete welcomed us into his home, went straight for the kettle and offered us a choice of tea. What more do we want? And it was a brilliant natter. Now, if you want to take a look at Pete's art, if you don't know, go to Pete McKee, that's P-E-T-E-M-C-K-E-E dot com. And while you're there, check it out. He has got a new exhibition on in Sheffield from the 14th to the 29th of July. It's called This Class Works. And it's a celebration of the spirit of the working class, the people, the pride, the tenacity, the hope, the passion. It's going to be another banger and it's sure to sell out. Pete's work always does. So go and get your tickets from there and join him. I know I'm going to try and get up for it. Well, look. Thank you so much for joining us. That is it. We're going to go. You need a refreshing brew, so go and sort that out. And we shall see you next week for episode 34. I've been Craig Parkinson. He's been producer Griff. And this has been the Two Shot Podcast. Have a brilliant week. Take care of yourself and stay safe. I'll see you then. Bye. Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. 